morning everybody and uh, thank you all for joining this Geneva Trade Week discussion on government intervention in the economy and uh, it just so happens that a World Economic Forum group is looking into this very question and so we're very eager to capture all of your insights and rope in uh, everybody who's joined uh, this call. But first, uh, some introductions. I'm Sean Doherty, Head of Trade and Investment at the World Economic Forum, and I'm joined by three carefully selected experts. These are Kamala Dawa, who's a senior lecturer in commercial law at the University of Sussex. And she was also the lead author on a uh, white paper which the forum community is writing on this topic. We also have uh, Janet Whitaker, who is a senior counsel at uh, Clifford Chance. And Janet has also been a member of the Forum's uh, Global Future Council on Trade and Investment. And she recently wrote a, a great blog I recommend to you all, linking trade rules and climate goals. And then thirdly, we have Mark Baketto, who is a counselor in the Economics Research and Statistics Division of the World Trade Organization. And he has some tremendous uh, publications out there on trade and employment. Now, the broad uh, layman's idea for our discussion today, uh, but which we very much want to refine in conversation with you all, is that some government actions are intended to apply to everyone, such as a, a sales tax, for instance, and others are much more specific and targeted uh, to a particular group, and sometimes not in a way which is necessarily objectively defined in advance, perhaps a, a company bailout. Um, and the distinction between these two is, of course, quite quite blurred. But within this uh, second, more specific group, uh, some actions are, of course, seen to be very positive. They may help with innovation, they may protect jobs, they may support environmental goals, whereas others, at least over time, are seen to be detrimental to broader public welfare. Now today, our particular interest is in those which have a something of a, a spillover effect uh, on other countries, perhaps even our bigger thy neighbor uh, type uh, impacts. And we want to th talk about what, if anything, trade policy should do about this. So, of course, this topic is not new. There's a long history here of discussion, negotiations, rulemaking around many types of interventions, be those subsidies, government procurement, state ownership or financing, competition policy enforcement, investment screening, and so on. But with the COVID pandemic, we've seen recently some very large government interventions. So it's probably a good time to refresh ourselves on the basic and think about what we might want to do differently. And so to start off, we have a poll for all of you um, that we'd like to pull up, if that's possible, uh, if our host is able to do that. Uh, there you go. You should see a little poll in your, perhaps in a side windows. So asking you, where are international rules most needed? Is it in subsidies, state ownership and control, government procurement, investment screening, or trade defense, trade remedies. So if you have a chance to vote on that, that would be great. Um, I think there may be, we'll leave that up for another 30 seconds or so, and then we'll get a, a result. Um, now, in just a moment, I'm going to be turning to the panelists. But uh, before I do that, we have one more assignment for all of you on the, the call today and perhaps the panelists too, which is to think of and to write down an example, any example you can think of, of a direct state intervention in its domestic economy, what effect, if any, that has had on trade and investment, and whether you think trade disciplines have had a role to play or, or should have a role to play. So again, when, when has a state made an intervention in its domestic economy that has had some kind of trade and investment effect, and whether trade rules uh, have, have played a, a role there. So, I'm not sure, are we able to see the results of our poll yet? Perhaps not. Okay, let's see. Are we able to then turn perhaps to our first panelist, who will be Mark? And we're going to start with uh, something of a, a stock take. 
So, Mark, can you tell us a little bit about what we know about how governments have intervened in the market so far in the, the pandemic? Sure. Hello, everyone. Um, so I, I'll essentially make four observations uh, on this topic. The first one will be uh, about the fact that several institutions have tracked uh, policy responses. And um, despite that, <laughs> uh, available inf information is largely patchy and incomplete. Uh, a second observation is that there are all sorts of policy responses of which some, only some, have an industrial policy dimension. Many of the responses are emergency measures which are often temporary uh, in nature. Third observation, with regard to trade measures, uh, attention has focused on export restrictions. Um, but there have been also a lot of uh, trade facilitating measures, and I'll uh, develop this. Uh, and fourth uh, observation, with regard to support measures, uh, enormous amounts of general economic support have been handed out by governments, and we see a shift uh, from income support, which was uh, sort of the initial, uh, the nature of the, most of the initial uh, uh, support, and towards more targeted support to certain firms and activities. So let me start with the sources of information. The ones I will focus on are uh, the WTO trade monitoring report, uh, which covers measures that restrict or facilitate trade, as well as trade remedy actions, SPS and TBT measures, services measures, government procurement, uh, intellectual property, and general economic support measures. Uh, Information is communicated by WTO members or collected and submitted to members for verification by uh, the Secretariat. A second source that I've used is, uh, and that, uh, uh, is an interesting one is the IMF Policy Tracker, uh, which summarizes the key economic measures governments are taking to limit the human and economic impact of the COVID-19 pandemic. Um, they distinguish, the IMF policy tracker actually distinguishes three types of measures, fiscal, monetary and macrofinancial, and exchange rate and balance of payments measures. So in the category, uh, uh, the fiscal category, you will uh, find a lot of uh, support measures. OECD uh, policy responses to COVID-19 gives you a good account of the, in particular, of the public procurement uh, measures that have been taken in response to the COVID uh, pandemic. Um, and they also have uh, a policy tracker which, which, uh, uh, which distinguishes between fiscal and monetary initiatives, employment and social initiatives. And finally, uh, the Global Trade Alert uh, uh, database also provides interesting information, although I haven't really found anything that specifically addresses the response to the COVID-19 uh, pandemic. Um, so I'll say a few words about the WTO data, but before uh, I do that, I want to uh, clarify the fact that um, uh, there are some gaps in the coverage. Uh, there are gaps in country coverage, mostly for LDCs and developing countries, and there are gaps for uh, support measures, in particular where clearly not all members uh, uh, report their measures. So the data have to be taken with a, a certain amount of uh, caution. Uh, the WTO trade monitoring report uh, shows that before May, 5, May 15, that's the sort of that's the, uh, the 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 time span we have. Uh, but uh, uh, starting with the COVID, uh, sort of with the time uh, of the reaction to the COVID, that's in February. Uh, so between February and May 15, members and observers implemented 256 COVID-19 related new trade and trade related measures of which, and that's interesting, actually 147 facilitated trade and 109 restricted trade. 28% of the restrictions had been repealed by mid-May. That uh, shows the, the temporary nature of many of those measures. Mostly uh, temporary, so those measures are actually mostly temporary uh, tariff reductions on the one hand, the ones that are facilitating, and export restrictions are of essential goods mostly uh, on the other side. Uh, they, uh, most, for, for most of them, they aim at ensuring the supply of essential goods for domestic consumers and were taken really relatively quickly after the start of the, of the pandemic. Uh, 
Uh, there are 468 COVID-19 related general economic support measures. And again, this is uh, uh, sort of, it's not the whole universe. It's, it's just uh, probably a sample because as I just mentioned, uh, we don't have, we cover uh, only um, partially uh, economic support measures. Uh, 99 COVID related services measures were taken of which most appear to be trade facilitating. Uh, 29 SPS measures and 53 uh, TBT uh, measures were taken, uh, initially restrictions and then subsequently more trade facilitation type measures. Uh, and trade remedy actions uh, uh, were taken, but here uh, I only have the total 239 were taken between October uh, 2019 and, and the 15th of May uh, 2020. Um, with regard to trade measure, measures, I just want to uh, uh, underline that export restric restrictions were the measures that attracted most of the attention. And that's uh, uh, because uh, for many economists and many uh, uh, people in general, they were seen uh, not to, be not, to not necessarily be the, the optimal response to the COVID-19 crisis. And uh, that's because uh, they drive up the world price of essential goods, because they aggravate shortages in import dependent countries, because uh, they can be counterproductive and, and because uh, they may induce retaliation, uh, which is problematic in the presence of, of global value chains. So a lot of the attention focused on export restrictions. And in many cases, those export, these export restrictions were actually withdrawn after uh, 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 a relatively short period. Um, Next, with regard to support measures, what can we say? Uh, that most of the COVID-related uh, general economic support measures uh, that were identified by the WTO, um, which include which included monetary, fiscal, and financial measures, uh, uh, etc., appeared to be temporary in nature. Um, the, this means that uh, regular monitoring will be very important in, in the, in the uh, sort of medium to long run to see what really happens to those measures that have been put in place. But uh, many of them were at least presented or introduced as, 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 as temporary. And uh, another thing is uh, that we observe a shift from income support uh, to uh, support to firms. And I just want to give an example of the, uh, for, for one, one country where uh, you, the, the examples of the, of the measures taken in the, as part of a, a first package, where uh, the, uh, the like of uh, spending on healthcare equipment, hospital capacity and R&D, expanded access to short-term work subsidy to preserve jobs and workers' income, uh, expanded childcare benefits for low-income parents and easier access to basic income support for the self-employed, etc. Temporarily expanded duration of unemployment insurance and parental leave benefits. While the second package actually included uh, other <laughs> types of measures, uh, and um, amongst uh, other things like temporary VAT reductions, income support for families, it included uh, things like expanded credit guarantees for exporters and export financing banks, subsidies invest investment in green energy and digitalization, expanding the volume and access to public guarantees for firms of different sizes, credit insurers and nonprofit institutions, uh, some eligible for up to 100% guarantees, offering facilities to public equity, uh, equity injection into firms with strategic importance. So obviously here we see a little bit of a shift towards measures that uh, smell much more like industrial policy than the ones that were introduced initially. Um, so I think that will stop here. Wonderful. Thanks a lot, Mark, for that uh, sort of situational update to get us started. Um, you know, as you mentioned, clearly some of these measures at the moment are of an emergency nature. Um, obviously, the question, you know, we're not expecting to maintain them long term, though obviously one question is how long they will persist. And we've also seen something of an evolution, it sounds like, since the global financial crisis. You know, some of the programs have changed. We see few of the cash for clunker type programs we saw in the past, maybe some more of these salary support uh, type uh, things. So maybe, Janet, um, if we can turn to you and hear, you know, what are your some thoughts on practical changes which might perhaps strike uh, a better balance between uh, trade rules to discipline all, all of this, whilst allowing the flexibility for emergencies, you know, the ability to intervene for long-term legitimate objectives like climate change, environmental protection, and so forth. Thank you, Sean. It's certainly an interesting question, I think, 
that you're posing, which is whether the pandemic has changed the dynamics of the political discussion on state intervention. And it certainly, in my view, accelerated state intervention, but I think it's part of a broader trend that we've seen, for example, in the United States, in the European Union and elsewhere, um, towards using state support to drive and shape economies. I think we've seen this just, you know, I think it's useful to give a little bit of background before going into the kinds of measures that, that might be um, considered. I think there's increasing political support, in particular in three areas, uh, for stronger government involvement and an active industrial policy. And these are obviously the first to address the pandemic. And we've heard from Mark about the various measures that governments are taking. The second is to address the challenge of digital and technological transformation of economies. And I think perhaps most significantly is climate change, where the rationale for industrial policy is the most most coherent. We've all seen uh, the sort of devastating pictures of various climate events around the world. And I think concerns in the past couple of years about climate change and the urgency of the science have given rise to a lot more vocal support uh, for mitigation and adaptation me uh, measures. And as a result of this, we've seen support for an industrial policy strategy to combat climate change. And one good example is the European Union's Green Deal, and we're also seeing it from the Democrats in the United States. Um, so I think it's probably helpful to think about what kinds of state intervention um, are involved here. First, and obviously, is large-scale investment, and this is really to promote green innovation. And this can't just come from the private sector because the private sector tends to focus on short-term profits rather than long-term trans transformational, in uh, transformational innovation. So what we need is significant public sector involvement to launch, support critical research and development, develop green infrastructure, and to operationalize and scale new technologies. There are also other industrial policy levers which are necessary to transition to a green economy. I think tax and other incentives, I think otherwise known as subsidies, um, regulations to shift away from high polluting activities uh, and products. This includes curbs and carbon emissions, for example, uh, regulation to incentivize green finance initiatives and sustainable investments, a carbon border adjustment tax to avoid carbon leakage and unfair competition, and then measures to safeguard innovation and technological development. So there are some examples. So if we think about those kinds of intervention, and then we think about, well, what kinds of actions do we need to think about in terms of practical changes to international trade rules? I think this is probably one of the greatest challenges that the global trading system faces today. And the reality is, is that trade disciplines will need to adapt to this fundamental shift in the political sphere in order to maintain relevance. Some of the actions, um, you know, I would suggest are encouraging more governments to join WTO discussions on reforming inefficient fossil fuel subsidies that encourage wasteful consumptions. Related to this, um, it, it may be helpful to encourage dialogue on whether WTO subsidies disciplines should be reformed in order to protect policy space for governments to invest in and provide support to climate-friendly uh, industries. Obviously, subject to these measures being tr as least trade restricted as, as necessary, transparent and, not and notified. Um, changes to government procurement rules um, to facilitate domestic investment in areas like green innovation and, tree and clean technology, modernization of infrastructure, and also in the pandemic context um, to ensure that critical medical supplies are available. There are also some other initiatives that don't necessarily require changes to trade rules, but would facilitate the pursuit of environmental and climate change goals. These are dialogue around the design of carbon pricing regimes and carbon border adjustment mechanisms so that they're consistent with international trade rules and fair to trading partners. And also governments should be encouraged to eliminate tariffs on environmentally friendly goods and undertake commitments on, on environmental services, as well as to pursue international standards um, for regulations that impact environmental goods and services. And the reality that we'll see is that several of these initiatives may encounter political and practical hurdles, and we may not find 
multilateral consensus at the WTO, but this doesn't preclude, co in like in many other areas, coalitions of like-minded countries from moving forward to develop rules that don't uh, obstruct or, or facilitate genuine public policy objectives like dealing with pandemics and, and addressing climate change. And just a few sort of minor points. I think trade agreements are important here. They give us the opportunity to enhance standards that are relevant to dealing with some of these uh, larger issues. It's essential to bring industry to the table um, to talk about these kinds of measures and into conversations around barriers to trade in, in these areas. I think last, but very importantly, it's uh, critical to ensure that the needs of developing countries, um, many of which are impacted in particular by climate change, but that their needs are addressed. And I think one area in particular that they need to be able to benefit from innovations in green technologies. Um, that are that are made or done in other countries so that we can facilitate their industrial development as well. So just a few, a whistle stop tool. Well, thank you, Janet. Well, there were some definitely some big questions you raised there about, you know, how do we prepare our economies for the longer term, the role of the private sector, et cetera. And I think we want to come back to several of those. But you also touched on a couple of specific actions we could take, right? So you mentioned the fossil fuel subsidies perhaps as being one of the more, more obvious ones. So maybe let's look at um, uh, another specific example, perhaps the one Mark mentioned of the you know fairly explicit issue of uh, export aid. Um, and Kamala, um, if I come to you, so again, you know, referring back to the 2008 financial crisis and then currently now, governments have obviously been keen to ensure that there's sufficient trade financing available. You know, it's been one of their worries. Um, but more generally, I mean, can you talk us through a little bit what would be the, is the logic for export credit uh, when we're not in the middle of a, a crisis? And, you know, how are we, we trying to discipline some of these, uh, you know, kind of more, more specific uh, uh, government interventions? Absolutely. Thank you very much. Um, yeah, so I think we all know that it's pretty difficult to tell um, whether we're talking about public welfare or corporate welfare when we're talking about subsidies, especially export subsidies. And you're right that the, um, the area of export credit agencies and public support for export financing is very opaque and it's very hard to see where corporate welfare and public welfare ends and begins. So just to give a bit of a definition about export finance, um, when, a, when a good or a service is uh, sold, 80% of world trade is underpinned by what we call export finance and their loans or guarantees or insurance to ensure the safe sale and uh, passage of, of the service or good. Now, this is supposed to be something attractive for the commercial financial sector. But when we have a crisis, often we find that liquidity in the in the financial commercial sector dries up, as we saw in 2008. So um, export credit agencies are really important to play this role of lender of last resort, as we see at the moment as well. So, um, so we, we're not surprised during a crisis that governments come in and help the private sector to provide financing for exports. But what's happened recently over the last 10 years since the last crisis is actually these export financing tools have become more um, a tool of industrial policy rather than just being a lender of last resort. But we can't actually see on a transactional basis very much about these um, these actual instruments. What we can see is that the OECD participants to um, the arrangement, which is an OECD arrangement regulating export credit to try and provide a level playing field and prevent a race to the bottom in export support and subsidies. Um, the OECD participants are the traditional rich countries who were basically monopolizing the export credit finance world because they had the money to subsidize their exporting firms. So we can see on the left here, the OECD participants, uh, after the financial crisis kicked off, we saw a, a big spike up into 12, 2012 of official public export credit support, which is, you know, just to remind you, this is taxpayers' money. Um, and then it comes down again and starts uh, spiking again in 2018. The big dramatic change in the market here is the entry of the non-OECD uh, export credit agencies, which is primarily China, India, Russia, Brazil, South Africa, the BRICS. And you can see from 2008, they have also been increasing their export credit activity to support their export financing. <clears throat> However, they are not members of the OECD arrangement. 
So they don't have to comply with the same uh, rules on due diligence and uh, subsidy control that the OECD arrangement um, puts forward. So we have two sets of regulatory uh, frameworks for these different actors. Now, that means that the WTO actually becomes the primary uh, uh, locus for regulating export credit support from non-OECD participants. And that puts a lot of pressure on, a, on an institution that wasn't actually designed and doesn't have those detailed rules. And we can see in the COVID crisis, uh, more measures have been taken. Again, we only have, because of the non-transparency, we have very little information. But the OECD survey of, of last month um, shows for OECD members, again, that's the primarily the uh, traditionally industrialized countries, they've put more working capital, they've modified their terms and conditions. So a lot of this activity is, out, is now taking place outside of the OECD, um, it's taking place outside of uh, the traditional countries that sort of uh, are trying to prevent a subsidy war. So we have a real problem in um, lack of due diligence, the chances that products and services are now being co competing not on price and quality, but on the export cover that's being provided by governments, which has a long-term competitive effect. Um, and we have the potential to have uh, more of a subsidy uh, war, a subsidy race, which again is at the cost of the public taxpayer and at a sustainability goals that we all have adhered to. So I'll, I'll stop there, but it's a, it's a, it's a real uh, case of where you can't tell the difference between public welfare and corporate welfare, uh, partly because of the lack of transparency. Fantastic. Thank you, Kamala. And yeah, that transparency point is one which is coming back to again and again. So look, so far we've done a bit of a tour of where we stand in general, you know, some couple of specific examples, the dilemmas we face and, you know, some first ideas about a potential way forward. So I think before we go to the audience, let's take advantage of our panelists' expertise and just squeeze in one, a couple more comments from them. So maybe Mark, coming back to you, uh, you know, we hear a lot at the moment that there's something of a trend towards economic nationalism. And so I'm wondering, is this something which you can try to detect a little bit in the statistics and pe perhaps push back on a little bit if there's any differentiation between, you know, what really seems to be nationalism driven as opposed to you know much more legitimate uh, domestic policy objectives well actually my my answer will be based uh, on a mapping of industrial policy instruments uh, in the digital era uh, that we conducted for the world trade report 2020 which will be issued in november so we worked on this in, in the re in the last uh, few months, uh, and this mapping is based on a review of the specific policy tools used by governments uh, over the past uh, decade. Uh, we used uh, two main sources of information. One is the data collected for the WTO uh, trade monitoring activity, and the second one uh, are the, is, the, uh, is data from the Global Trade Alerts uh, database. Um, I, my response, again, will consist in five points. One, um, available information. Uh, suggests that trade uh, remedies accounted for a large and steady number of new measures over the last decade, followed by import tariffs and support measures in that order. But specific information on some key instruments is lacking. And again, I'm talking here about mostly about subsidies and, uh, and, uh, and support more generally. Uh, industrial policy, but that's, that's not the only uh, <laughs> part that's not very well covered. Uh, industrial policies are widely used to support uh, traditional sectors and to attract investments. Um, but at the same time, uh, an increasing emphasis has been placed on fostering uh, innovation in the digital sector. And that's what we focused on. So uh, our view is a bit sort of uh, biased in, in the sense that we really focused on this. And so we, we, we looked at, at the digi digital sector and measures taken in the in the in the in this area uh, more than uh, sort of uh, at, at the whole uh, uh, picture. Um, and, and we fo really focused on innovation policies that which we think are now uh, one of the main uh, uh, instruments of, of uh, industrial policy, uh, in particular in the digital uh, sector. Uh, innovation policies include a mix of traditional and new instruments. And I'll discuss a little bit what uh, sort of instruments governments have, have used. 
Uh, so first, uh, old school policies are, are still there. Um, a, a high density of industrial policy tools are applied to, to traditional industries such as minerals, metals, uh, chemical industries, textiles and clothing, electrical machinery and transport equipment. Um, this is mostly trade remedies and export uh, restrictions, uh, which are widely used for the minerals, metals and chemical industries, local content requirements and government procurement measures uh, only account for three to six percent of the of the new interventions. So pretty traditional <laughs> uh, um, uh, instruments. Many support measures are horizontal in nature, not attributed to a specific sector, for example, tax holidays for corporate investment, uh, while vertical support measures tend to focus on, on a couple of industries, uh, transport equipment, minerals and metals mostly. But new trends can be observed. And uh, while uh, some uh, traditional policy instruments such as, uh, as tariffs are being liberalized in the digital sector, uh, other traditional instruments are used to support digitalization and the ICT sector. Uh, for instance, direct public funding of R&D in the ICT sector uh, seems to play a critical role. Uh, a number of government actually increasingly uh, resort to innovation-oriented public procurement. Uh, there has been a significant increase in the use of local content measures in the ICT sector. But at the same time, there has been an increase in new types of government interventions to foster uh, digital innovation. Uh, and uh, what we see is uh, measures such as uh, promoting clusters and tech hubs uh, and new regulatory approaches such as regulatory sandboxes and data sharing sh schemes and some other measures used to address some of the digital challenges, such as uh, data flow uh, restrictions, data localization requirements, and reforms of taxation policy. Uh, while some uh, of the data-related policies are actually motivated by concerns about privacy and security, other clearly seem to be more closely linked to industrial policy objectives. So let me stop here, uh, but this, this is sort of to give uh, a sense of the trends that we have observed uh, over the last uh, decade in, in, in this area. But again, we, we on purpose actually f uh, sort of uh, focused on the digital sector because we wanted to see what, what was uh, happening there. Okay, fantastic. Thank you. So, yeah, so for whatever reasons, lots of different support mechanisms used, lots of innovation happening. I guess ultimately what matters is, you know, the, the consequences of, of these. So coming back to you, Janet, what have you been hearing from businesses, your clients or others on, you know, which of these measures are really affecting their trade and investment decisions? Um, so one of the key concerns of, you know, the sort of that I hear about in the business community um, is you know, a, new, a slew of new measures and sort of how difficult it is to follow the rules of the road, so what the rules of the road are in sort of the trade context these days. Um, I say this because a lot of the new areas of law and regulation are areas about which there's significant uncertainty about the key terms and provisions and also about how they'll be applied. There are also areas where there's a lot of government discretion, which makes it even more difficult to follow or to predict exactly what it means for business. I think one example is the screening of uh, inbound investment. Um, and there can be uncertainty here because very often the measures um, are rooted in difficult to pin down concepts. For example, in the United States, national security interests in the European Union, public order. And these are also areas in which governments are really given the broadest deference. And I think there are also areas where government feels less compelled to explain why it's taken decisions, which uh, means that there aren't reasons forthcoming for why certain measures are taken. And that makes it more difficult to, for business to predict what will happen going forward. I think another new feature is that, you know, back to the word new, some of these areas are areas where neither government nor business have very much experience in how, in how or track record. I'm thinking one area here is, for example, the United States uh, new rules on information and communications, technology and services, the supply chain regulations, which can potentially allow the uh, U.S. government to direct a U.S. company to change its global footprint because of national security concerns. 
um, we've seen around the world as well, um, as Mark has uh, spoken about, measures that have take, been taken uh, to deal with COVID, and particularly in the context of reshoring supply chains. Um, some of these, you know, maybe short term, but I do think there's a, a concern about them having much longer term reverberations. Um, just changing tack very slightly. I think the other area where there's a lot of business concern is just generally on the more sort of traditional trade issues that are arising. Um, for example, um, in the context of the US China uh, disputes, will the tariffs on China continue? Until when? Um, could they be ratcheted upwards? There's no clarity around that. How will labor standards in, in the new USMCA be, uh, be interpreted and applied? Um, in the Brexit context, I think it's difficult for business when negotiations are ongoing, but there isn't a lot of clarity about where we might come out. And I think all of these examples really underscore the need for the business community to understand what the rules of the road are and, and what they're likely to be. Um, I think a lot of businesses spend a lot of time trying to analyze uh, what outcomes may be depending on who's occupying critical sort of decision-making roles in business. Um, even in the face of uncertainty, business needs to move forward. And I think that also comes with the necessity in many cases to evaluate risk and often to disclose it as well, which can be complicated. And there also can be reputational risk associated with this policy uncertainty. I think this is really important. Um, businesses just don't want to find themselves um, making decisions that put them on the wrong side of a policy development that hasn't yet come down the road. So they'll be taking a decision that's perfectly legitimate that may actually turn out to be uh, something that is less so down the road. So I think at the moment, one of the key concerns is really trade uncertainty for businesses, which I think is probably at a comparatively high level uh, at the moment. Great, thanks, Janet. And definitely on that investment screening point, I would agree with you. In the um, the forum, we hear really a lot uh, about this issue raised by companies very frequently, and a lot of concern about what is the is there sufficient clarity around the purpose behind some of the, the screening mechanisms? And I think we also probably want to come back to you on uh, on Brexit if we can. Lots of interest there. Um, but first, Kamala, um, you know, I think rules obviously are, I guess, mainly useful if they're actually enforced. And so maybe building on your earlier example, I mean, I think uh, enforcement or the export subsidy rules and others has been, shall we say, imperfect. And so what is standing in the way, uh, perhaps, of better enforcement of, of those rules we actually have? Well, I, I think there are two aspects to this. One is the rules are really out of date now. We've seen that uh, the regula regulatory framework was really uh, built around a different set of players. And now we have more actors, uh, more governments that are providing export support specifically. Uh, the rules really need, need to be updated. The OECD has got a very small membership uh, relatively speaking now to the, the activity that's happening in the world. Um, but the OECD is really important because not only does it, it um, offer this um, commitment to the level playing field, it also has these due diligence requirements, uh, which are environmental, social, human rights, and, and also debt sustainability. So we, I think the best thing that could happen, you know, ideally there would be a successor arrangement to the OECD that actually included the new actors such as China, India, Brazil, South Africa. Um, that has been very difficult to uh, achieve, especially now with the trade war. That's the effort within the International Working Group for Export Support uh, has, been, has been going on since 2012. Um, the big problem with the WTO is that in the, in the subsidies agreement, fundamentally, we don't have a, a real understanding of, of notification of subsidies because notifications is low. And there aren't these explicit exemptions and exceptions for justifiable uh, export subsidies in export finance. For example, during a crisis is lender of last resort. And without that ability to justify a measure, um, because you haven't got legal clarity as to whether you can justify it under those rules. You have a chilling factor on the whole, the whole area because governments aren't really going to uh, test out um, unknown uh, regulation to try and justify a measure just for the sake of it. So actually what you seem to have is quite a chilling factor on bringing export subsidies in the form of export support to the WTO. Um, 
so we, we also have those, and I'm not going to talk about the real problems with the WTO dispute settlement mechanism, but all of these uh, different factors compound the chilling factor on this. And what can be happening is we have this subsidy war and we're actually crowding out the private sector, which is actually designed to fulfill this function in good, in good times. Excellent. Thank you. So I think, bang on time now, we're going to turn to the audience. Now, those of you in the audience, I think you may not be able to see this, um, but I can see that there are some 30 plus of you here and uh, among you, a number of very eminent uh, trade uh, professionals and experts. So I will encourage you all to get involved. Um, I think you can perhaps raise your hand uh, on the participants list, or alternatively, just signal in the chat uh, that you would like to, to take the floor. Um, and as a reminder, you know, as well as a question to, to any of our panelists, if you're able to share a very short uh, example of state intervention in the domestic economy, impacts it had, and what you think uh, rules uh, would be helpful in that context. So let's see, how can we uh, can we identify anyone who would like to come in? Maybe I can just ask the, um, are you able to show the uh, the poll, uh, our hosts there? We had the, the results from that, or maybe um, whilst we're, that can come up in a moment. Um, I think we had, Amar came in with a, a question in the chat. Um, is Amar able to be given the floor? Um, good morning, everyone. Can you hear me? Yes. Yeah, it's Amar here. So thank you very much um, uh, for convening the panel. Uh, I, I'll just restate the question I asked in, in the chat box, which is um, as follows. Uh, as part of uh, in the aftermath of COVID, uh, if we can not optimistically speak about an aftermath of COVID, um, a lot of uh, uh, governments are intervening, but with the perspective of building back better, particularly uh, with, with the objective of decarbonizing uh, various industrial structures and sectors. Uh, an example of this is the automotive sector, where there are a lot of initiatives to support electrical vehicle manufacturing and to underpin that through um, uh, battery manufacturing, particularly the, the development of gigafactories. Um, there are a lot of market failures involved in, in, in that sort of industrial transformation. And from an economic point of view, those market failures do justify government intervention. Uh, but by definition, those market failures are specific. They're specific to, to those activities and sectors. Uh, and that specificity, as well as the fact that these are internationally traded products, brings them firmly within the scope of, of the FCM. Um, so I guess my question is, you know, how should trade rules be calibrated uh, on one hand to uh, allow for uh, government intervention that does favour a public policy goal, which is decarbonisation and industrial transformation, uh, but also uh, mitigate what seems to be happening now, which is an emerging industrial strategy rivalry between a number of jurisdictions over green technologies and the possible negative consequences that has on resource allocation and trade. Great question, Amar. Let's try and get one or two more. So I think we have uh, Peter Parmentier has also written in the chat. Perhaps Peter would like to take the floor. No, perhaps not. So um, maybe then if anybody would uh, from the panelists would immediately like to go into Amar's point around kind of green industrial rivalry. Any volunteers? I, I don't mind kicking it off. I think Janet probably has quite a few uh, sort of specific things to say, but just to kick it off, I mean, under Article 20 in the GATT, if you have a trade regulation, that is designed to uh, support industry, uh, ec environmental objectives, and there's a clear uh, relationship between the measure and the objective, then it's justified under Article 20. Under the subsidy agreement, we don't have that. And that, I mean, it, uh, the jurisprudence says it's not clear whether Article 20 exceptions applies to the subsidies and countervailing measures agreement, but actually just not knowing 
is a problem. So, so either there should be a, a clear acknowledgement that there aren't any exceptions, even for good subsidies. And this is an old debate. This has been going on for a long time. There are good subsidies and there are bad subsidies. So why don't we have some rules so we can see, is this public welfare or is this corporate welfare? What is going on here? It's, it just seems in the 21st century, there's something really out of, out of line with, with all the good governance guidelines that every international organization uh, disseminates and advocates. And we have got a very patchy uh, set of rules for what is now becoming um, a systemic game. It's not like just the old traditional countries are subsidizing. Uh, we're all non-market economies now. So let's, let's accept this and get some rules that we can actually start judging whether these, um, these measures can be justified as in the public interest. Um, over to Janet. I think, Hannah, you, you uh, covered it uh, sort of perfectly. It seems to be the classic example, as Hannah just pointed out, of why there needs to be dialogue around these issues. I think we're in this you know, relatively new situation where we have two things coinciding. One that's imperative to deal with climate change, and that really is a political imperative. And I don't think we can ignore it. Um, in some ways, uh, it is that we have had a paradigm shift and the trade rules need to be able to work with that paradigm shift because otherwise um, there is a risk that they start to become less relevant. I think the politics of this can't be avoided. Um, so we have this climate change on the one hand and then obviously the innovation necessary to uh, adapt to, to mitigate and adapt to climate change also involves technological innovation. And that's really the second angle of industrial subsidy, which is in part fueled by, um, you know, sort of broader concerns about um, broader trade rivalries, I'd say. Um, I do think that there is a lack of clarity around what is permitted here, as Kamla pointed out, but the, so I don't have any answers, but I think that the trade rules need to shift with the times, or there needs to be dialogue that helps them to move with the times. They may be adequate as they are, but there needs to be a discussion around it, because I don't think the politics of intervention will go away. I think Rudolf Adlam has raised his hand. Are you able to get Rudolf on the line? Can you hear me? Can you hear me? We can. Uh, you can? Sorry. Yes, loud and clear. Okay. Uh, the discussion so far, in my view, has focused on subsidies and trade interventions affecting trade in goods. And the implicit argument seems to be that trade in services and government interventions in trade in services are less problematic, so to speak. And that's quite strange given the fact that, for example, export subsidies in services are not disciplined at all as long as they comply with the national treatment obligation and national treatment again is negotiable under the agreement. So therefore I'm a bit concerned that this services trade aspect gets out of perspective. And also the fact that the borderline between goods and services trade is blurred. So for example, contract manufacturing services or manufacturing operations on based on inputs provided by others are a service. So there is a, a, a large, to my extent, area of fog between goods and services trade and the application to the re relative or respective rules in either area. I would like to, to give, have some comments on that from the panel. Excellent point, Rudolf. Maybe we can turn to Mark. I mean, as a first point, is there much we can tell from the data around uh, interventions relative to services? Well, uh, as mentioned, we, uh, I mean, the WTO actually covers those measures. I mentioned that 99 measures have been 
uh, introduced by governments according to the database uh, um, uh, in the post-COVID uh, uh, period. Um, uh, I didn't really have a close look at them, but I know that uh, um, almost all of them are actually trade facilitating, which does not mean, again, that <laughs> this is all there is. But uh, but uh, I, uh, I definitely agree with what uh, Ralph has said. Uh, maybe one, uh, uh, one point I wanted to make that's more in relation to the previous question is that uh, as an economist, I think uh, um, what could help with, with the discussions and the dialogue on, on, uh, on this uh, question of the green subsidies and how to allow a green subsidies while avoiding the green uh, rivalry to simplify uh, is, is, a, is a better uh, understanding and more uh, evidence on uh, the size of uh, uh, um, sort of cross-border spillovers and, and spillovers more generally. I think we have very, very little evidence on 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 those effects, and I think they sort of they would inform the discussion. It's not all of what you need, but they would definitely help uh, with the with the with the discussion on 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 this. A better understanding of what the effects of those measures are, not only in the country but on other countries. I mean, can help definitely decide how how they should be regulated. Any other responses on services and you know, do these yeah. questions apply to law firms and academics? Well, I, actually, I have an important point to make about, again, about the transparency issue. Because when we're looking at export credit support on a governmental level, and it's uh, annual reporting is really what we have. Have you got some ba background noise from me? I have background noise. Um, the, the reporting data is all aggregate. So we don't know the transactions. So I can't tell you if uh, the UK export finance uh, intervention supporting domestic exports in, let's say, Rwanda is a good or a service. Unless they have it as a prestige project and I see a little picture of something like a, a crane digging something out. They're all aggregate data. You have no idea of which transactions. You cannot follow the money. You cannot follow the transaction to see if there is additionality, what the impact is on the ground, whether it is promoting sustainable development. So part of the problem is when I talk about export uh, trade finance covering 80% of trade goods and tr services, I have to lump it together. I have no idea from the data. And that data is not being shared by governments. So again, we have this kind of like a uh, gray area of, of, of what, what exactly are you covering and, and what are the terms and conditions and was there anybody in the private sector that could have done that? So this is a real problem, just getting transactional data to tell whether it's a service or a good. Uh, Janet, otherwise I think we have Peter Palantir back on the line perhaps. Uh, Peter? Good. Um, yeah, thanks. And uh, also thanks to the panel uh, for, for the presentations. There is one kind of uh, fictitious case study that I would uh, that I would like to present. Um, the case study is um, a state-owned bank that is providing a loan at favorable terms to a, a parent company of an SOE, state-owned uh, enterprise. Um, then the SOE manufactures a product at one of its uh, subsidiaries, um, thereby using local content, and then exporting the product um, with, with the help of export uh, credits, then exporting the uh, product to a third country. Then my question would be, um, I, th I think it would depend on the facts if, if there are some trade restrictive uh, measures here. But my question would be, what if this case study becomes a bit more uh, structural in nature and then how to tackle this problem? Great. I mean, I think this is one of the classic uh, examples in, in this field. So good that we've come to it. Um, open to any of the panelists who would like to comment on this, whether we have the rules to uh, tackle this type of situation or not? Everybody's shaking their head. <laughs> well, the rules are out of date and value chains and supply chains, it, it, it really breaks down completely, uh, particularly when you're looking at whether the subsidy, where is the subsidy, what are the spillovers of, of a subsidy to a certain part of a supply chain, 
How does that affect other uh, transactions? I'm completely in the dark here. No one else is willing to get ahead of the policymakers on this one. Okay. Peter, we, we may need you, you to answer your own question in, in a moment. Um, let's go to uh, Oliveira. She has a question. Are we able to get Oliveira on the line? No. Okay. Um, well, let me take advantage of this little um, lull then. Uh, oh, hang on. Let, let's just read out Oliveira's question because I think she's having some audio questions, uh, difficulties. So she's asking whether WTO members will start challenging now some of the COVID-19 recovery programs. Um, you know, I think obviously people have given a little bit of leeway uh, during the emergency, but as we, you know, are coming on to a year on to this pandemic, uh, are people going to start pushing back against some of these these programs? I'll just step in here again. I know I don't know about countries, but I think in the EU there are going to be some, there is going to be pushback. I know Ryanair is already complaining about uh, subsidies that uh, supposedly have gone to another airline. Um, so I'm not sure about the WTO because the enforcement mechanism is so different. But in the EU, I think you will see some uh, raised eyebrows and uh, a few uh, sort of terse emails. Just, just adding to that, um, it also goes to the point of you're making a year on. Doesn't it depend on how directly connected they are to the pandemic, which is a, a difficult question at the moment, given that it is going on for quite a long period. Um, and you know whether they sort of become a more permanent feature. I think it will be difficult. There will be some issue around: is it really responsive, legitimate response to the pandemic, or is it actually something more structural, more systemic? So I suspect that at some point we may get some pushback and some disputes. That that issue will will arise. And I think this is one of the reasons why we're having this discussion. Obviously, is because people are wondering about what's going to happen as we come out of this pandemic and are we going to be able to have the, you know, at least the right principles, the approaches in place to, to deal with this and trying to make some kind of differentiation and, you know, reason dialogue about what is uh, reasonable to keep in place and, and what isn't. Um, Can I just make one more point on that? I think one of the interesting things is you sort of look at the connection between the pandemic and, you know, my um, sort of hobby horse, uh, climate change issues. Um, we already, you know, some of the recovery packages are directly connected to issues, climate change issues. For example, in France, um, we see incentives, quite significant incentives being given to French citizens to actually buy um, electric or hybrid cars. Uh, if you look at the sort of proposals here, um, that Vice President Biden has for what would happen if you know he wins the presidency. The the connections it, recovering from COVID, so not necessarily directly um, addressing immediate issues around the pandemic, but longer term recovery issues are directly connected as well to climate change issues. So uh, you know I think it, it's in, all of these things intersect in some way. Um, but again, it, it will come down most likely to timing or to some degree to timing issues. I have to declare a, uh, um, an interest here. Being a French resident, I've directly benefited from a 10,000 euro uh, bonus for buying an electric car. And so for me, it's been wonderful. And I love my car. But anyway, you'll have to take my uh, comments on this with a <coughs> pinch of salt. Um, Maybe, uh, Janet, can we just stick with you for one more minute and go back to the, the Brexit question? Um, so, you know, as as I understand it, uh, you know, the UK and the EU are still negotiating over state aid rules. Um, you know, from the outside, you wouldn't have thought there would necessarily be that much of a substantive difference of opinion between the uh, 
the two groups. Uh, but do you think actually a you know a substantive difference of approach is envisaged by by either? So it's possibly a million dollar question, but uh, I think you know as you point, it's one of the um, major sticking points in the current negotiations. And I think you know from what we've seen, particularly even in the last few days, it looks like there could potentially be some divergence. I think if people know. The EU is very anxious about the level playing field um, in the economic relationship, and its initial position, at least, was that the UK um, should remain within the EU's state aid regime. And the UK government, um, you know, obviously one of the central motivations for Brexit was to allow the UK to actually determine its own economic policy. So it seemed quite firm about the fact that it must have the flexibility. I think as uh, the business secretary said recently, as an independent sovereign nation, to intervene to support new and emerging industries. Um, so we we obviously know what the EU regime looks like. Um, the UK has so far said that it will follow WTO uh, rules um, following the transition period. Uh, there is a consultation that will go on in the coming months about the uh, UK subsidy. Uh, state aid regime, um, but I think by implication that's going to be after the transition period, and we really don't know what the shape of it will be yet. So there's some, but the fact that the UK doesn't want to adhere to the EU regime suggests that we will not, in fact, have complete convergence. Well, I expect that will now result in a flood of questions and comments from everybody. Um, I think let's just try one more time to see if we can pull up those poll results so we don't. Forget those. Ah, here we go. Um, so, remind our question was which of these most desperately need rules? Um, and it looks to me that people were most interested in subsidies, then investment screening and trade defense, but felt that state ownership and government procurement were less important or, or well controlled already. Anything surprising there? Particularly Mark having a, a good handle on. Um, <laughs> What, what's happening already? Does that surprise you at all? You're on mute, I think. Well, uh, yes, it does surprise me a little bit. Uh, in particular, the the fact that uh, no one seems to think that there there's a need for uh, rules on or for rethinking the rules on state ownership. But uh, that's the one that surprises me most, I guess. Um, I'm not surprised about the subsidies. I'm I'm. Uh, um, not surprised about the other results, but uh, that one surprises me a little bit. But maybe, yeah. yeah. Right. Well, I, I I don't think that necessarily our audience is a completely representative um, set of all WTO negotiators, but uh, <laughs> interesting nonetheless. Maybe, Mark, sticking with you, um, I mean, all of these uh, tools, if you like, are perhaps more available to, to developed economies. And, you know, much of our conversation so far has been on developed economies. What, what should developing economies be doing? Um, you know, obviously, some of them are employing them, you know, particularly when we talk about the larger economies. But when we talk about smaller economies, developing economies, what are the options available for them? Um, <laughs> I, I'm, I'm, I'm really not, uh, not in the business of telling uh, developing and, and LDC, developing countries and LDCs what they should be doing, but I mean, uh, I, I suppose uh, uh, some of them will sort of um, uh, uh, be inspired by, by, by what uh, the, the, the richer countries uh, do, and uh, then there are limits to what they can do. So uh, in terms of uh, the, the, the depth of their pockets, uh, so I, I guess. Uh, uh, um, if I had to uh, uh, to imagine what uh, some of the countries uh, may be tempted to do, it's uh, is is to use uh, instruments that are uh, not necessarily the same as uh, as uh, the ones uh, used by uh, developed countries to do similar things. Uh, but uh, but again, uh, um, I think a lot of action has been uh, in the area of uh, of. Um, of investment uh, policies, where we have we see some some uh, some trends, 
uh, where we didn't see much um, uh, sort of uh, uh, restrictive, many restrictive measures, and we see an increasing number of restrictive uh, measures that restrict uh, uh, investment um, and sort of appearing in, in various countries. Um, so yeah, I think uh, that that's what I, I would I would say. But I mean, uh, so it's a uh, it's it's an interesting question. Uh, the, the trends we or what we see now is uh, is not. Uh, I, I can't really say that there are clear trends towards uh, uh, um, in, in what I've seen towards uh, uh, the use of particular instruments, except with the one I just mentioned. Okay. Well, perhaps to put it another way, it's you know an additional reason to try and make sure we get the rules right. Um, you know, under the logic that the bigger economies can look after themselves to a certain extent, but for the smaller developing economies, maybe important. Um, we have another question coming in from Aditi. Can she be given the uh, the floor? Hello. Um, so my question was that there seems to be increasing interest in the U.S. and maybe in other countries as well of using government procurement for promoting domestic production. Um, I was watching recently, uh, Joe Biden referred to his $700 billion plan um, during the recent presidential debate. So regardless of who wins, it's it's likely that something along those lines will go through. And I was wondering what the panelists thought about how other members of the WTO government procurement agreement were likely to react. Great question. Anyone? I'm not a government procurement expert, but you know, one of the things that immediately comes to mind is that the United States is unlikely to be alone in wishing to, uh, you know, the European Union, for example, in its Green Deal, in, in, its, in its plans generally. I think that this is not something that is singular to the United States, and it may in fact be something that a lot of countries are interested in doing, which, again, Query whether that leads everybody back to the table to sort of talk about how to uh, permit this or to ensure that the government procurement agreement is sort of updated in a way that it is as uh, least disruptive as necessary as, as possible. Uh, maybe I should come in here because I do a lot of work with the uh, WTO GPA secretariat. Um, I think under the WTO GPA, it's not a most favoured nation um, uh, obligation. So actually the obligations are, are strictly bilateral. So you can be very strategic and carve out uh, what you don't want to have covered by the agreement. And that's what a lot of countries have done. So the US already has a lot of carve outs for small, medium sized enterprises, for disadvantaged communities, and they've very carefully calibrated their offer under the schedules. The problem for the EU is that they haven't done the same sort of strategic protectionism because they were interested in the internal market level playing field and they didn't want the member states to start uh, bringing in all these binationals. So the EU, obviously, we know they've got a much stricter level playing field uh, regulation, reg regulatory framework. I think as countries join the government procurement agreement, they're much more savvy about realising, and their lobby groups are savvy, what they want to protect and what they want to open up. And it should be a strategic game. We need more competition here. We have export uh, potential here, but we need to protect here. Um, I think really it's the EU has has gone a different route in the negotiation to all the other countries. And that's why the UK is sort of thinking, well, actually, maybe we want to go the US route. Maybe we want to have protection for SMEs. Maybe we want to have more carve outs. And we can't do that if we stick with the EU route. So it was, it was from the different ideological perspective, the internal market, free movement um, versus, well, we want to protect our disadvantaged communities. We want to, we want to protect, keep transportation out. So I think it's going to be a lot more sort of strategic. But just to say something about the GPA, it was revised in 2012. So it's pretty streamlined and up to date uh, in terms of what we think of good governance. It's, it's that market access, the schedules, that's very kind of tricky and bilaterally uh, negotiated. So I think that's another reason why the UK doesn't want to be part of this whole package of uh, the single internal market rules. 
Thanks. Mark, were you signaling to come in there as well? Yeah, uh, maybe just a couple of words on uh, sort of uh, not exactly on government procurement, but government procurement can, can sort of be linked to uh, all the measures uh, that some governments are, are putting in place or uh, announcing, let's say, uh, concerning the uh, sort of reshoring, the reorganization of, uh, of uh, global value chains and uh, uh, the, the diversification of, uh, of uh, suppliers. And, and I think uh, what uh, uh, sort of we've been saying about, about those measures is that they uh, may not necessarily be uh, the best, uh, the, the, again, the best response to uh, uh, the, the COVID crisis or what, what has been learned from the COVID crisis. And that uh, cooperation here could be playing a very important role in terms of putting in place uh, other measures, for instance, uh, in, uh, in relation to uh, the supply of, uh, of essential goods in times of uh, crisis. Um, reshoring is, uh, or reorganization of value chains, um, shortening of value chains, et cetera, is not necessarily the, 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 the most efficient, the most, uh, the optimal response actually to, uh, to some of those concerns. Thanks. Okay, I'll remind everybody on the call that we're gradually getting towards the end. So this is going to be your almost last chance to uh, for the audience to come in with uh, questions or comments. We encourage you to do that. Um, whilst you're thinking through your uh, clear question, let me just maybe come back to Mark immediately um, on this this point around transparency, which is you know brought up a, a number of times. And obviously, you know, one fantastic thing we could do is increase, I think, your budget. That would be very helpful. Um, you know, mention has been made of the Global Trade Alert and the great work they're doing. Any other thoughts on what could be done by uh, the WTO, by other institutions, by private sector, you know, by governments themselves and kind of volunteering information? What do we need? Just unmute yourself again. Maybe just just uh, sort of at the WTO, there are two ways to to sort of collect data. The main one is obviously uh, notifications because members are supposed to uh, notify report uh, uh, on on the policies that they they are using, and uh, they're not always doing that. And it's it's an important issue and one that that uh, members uh, uh, want to discuss, or some members in particular want to uh, put on the table. And I think that's that's definitely a a, a promising uh, uh, approach. Now, uh, it, it can only go so far because the reasons why uh, members do not always notify what they should be notifying, uh, because there, there are obligations to notify uh, that uh, uh, that are already out there. It's not that uh, they don't exist. Uh, it, it, there are various reasons, and, and um, some were mentioned earlier in the, in the discussion. Um, um, Sort of a technical cooperation can also play a role in for some some countries. Uh, so uh, it, it's a complex uh, issue, and uh, and so uh, I think uh, this this part is sort of uh, uh, ho will hopefully be taken care of uh, at, at the WTO in discussions when uh, when. Uh, when the members uh, see uh, an interest in this, the other uh, of this, the, sort of the other channel through which you can collect information is obviously with money, but that's more uh, what uh, <laughs> UNCTAD and, and ITC have been doing, uh, and um, and so they are they've been uh, sort of trying to collect uh, to improve the collection of uh, of uh, information on on most uh, non-tariff measures, uh, and and um, and uh, I think uh, if I'm not mistaken, uh, there some efforts will go in the direction of improving uh, uh, or in actually collecting because they, they they haven't really been collecting information on subsidies until uh, now. So I think uh, a pilot uh, project is, uh, is, uh, is foreseen and, and I hope that there too there will be uh, there will be improvements. Now obviously if we get money to do this at the WTO it's <laughs> why not? <laughs> right. Well, I guess what this whole conversation has been leading to is, well, what do we do next, right? Um, so obviously we can fund Mark's department better, um, but beyond that, I mean, turning maybe to each of the panelists uh, in turn, what do you see as potential next steps? Is there a roadmap for action in the WTO or, you know, 
more research papers? What what what, what can we as a community do uh, to try and uh, move us forward? Um, maybe start with, I don't know, Janet, and then Nicole. Um, maybe if I could pick on one particular issue, which sort of doesn't relate to something else we've talked about, but I think in the context of the pandemic, we've certainly seen the importance of um, digital tra trade and, and data flows. Um, I certainly think that's an issue that interests states and business. There's, you know, a, we need a broad coalition to deal with that. And there are various opportunities for action there. I think we certainly need trade policies that support these flows. Um, one potential platform for progressing these is in the context of e-commerce negotiations at the WTO. There also needs to be more regulatory cooperation, just generally to ensure that there's interoperability, to facilitate cross-border data flow. Um, issues around digital payments systems, which, you know, would help also developing countries. And I think finally, and really importantly, in the context of sort of the fragmentation, but to address concerns about data security. And I think that's one area where it would be really valuable um, for like-minded countries or relatively like-minded countries to sit down to discuss a potential international set of rules um, to gather data protection. I think that would sort of help to uh, sort of continue to support digital trade, which I think would be beneficial to business and countries around the globe. That's my Yes, quickly. I saw a point made by uh, by Amar, and and I think I need to add a little bit to what I said. I said that it's mostly notifications and collection of information, but indeed the WTO has a number of other mechanisms through which uh, we contribute to transparency, and that would be the trade policy reviews, the dispute settlement mechanism, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So on the, uh, on those, I don't know that uh, there is necessarily a lot more we can do, uh, but uh, yeah, I, indeed that's absolutely true. Uh, there are also discussions in the committee that contribute to transparency. So there, there are many other mechanisms which are playing a very important role. Uh, I focused on, on two, but uh, yeah, indeed there are, there are more than those two. Yes, Amar, your question was a little bit leading. Do you want to comment on that uh, briefly? If we can put Amar back on the line. Hi, sorry. Yeah, thanks. I guess a full disclosure, I used to work for the Trade Policies Review Division on, on, on TPRMs. Um, so hence the, the genesis of my question. So I identified the three legs of the WTO negotiations, dispute settlement, uh, and the TPRs. The, the purpose behind the TPRs was really to stimulate an informed discussion uh, outside uh, sort of litigious and negotiation context of of the trade policies pursued by uh, by different countries, and I think picking up on um, uh, Kamala's point about uh, you know how do these subsidies work? Are they targeting corporate welfare? Are they targeting uh, public welfare goal? The, the reality is that you know these are all mixed goods, so there'll be an element of of private return to them to these interventions. Um, but the, the 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 difficulty is that. Um, you know, over the years, the the WTO system has hasn't really paid much attention to the transparency area and, and the the peer review mechanism. Uh, and so, if we were looking at channeling and resources, my question is, well, would wouldn't you want to invest a lot more heavily in in actually stimulating an, an understanding and an informed discussion uh, around the policy formulation and uh, and implementation process when it comes to these matters in these countries? Uh, to, if you like, develop um, uh, a more collaborative approach to to dealing with uh, you know matters like um, uh, decarbonisation, which, as I said, ultimately aim at providing a global public good, um, uh, even though they're reliant on country-specific uh, uh, interventions. Thanks, Kamala. Do we come to you on that uh, next steps question? I th actually, I think Amar really has it right. It's about finding sort of coalitions of like-minded um, actors who can push uh, the agenda out of politicization and populism and back into kind of rational policy making and um, 
realizing that in, in the case of subsidies, you know, there is a real reason for cooperation. It doesn't, it's not in anybody's interest to get into a subsidy race. Uh, no country can just print money forever and just think that they're going to win a subsidy race that way. And also it's the taxpayer that's supporting this. So there are lots of coalitions and the companies that don't get the support are also part of that coalition that want fairer rules. It's like antitrust, you know, it should be a win-win. But somehow the political discussion has taken it away from the win-wins to some sort of like zero-sum game. Perfect. Well, look, we're coming towards the end of uh, this uh, session, this discussion. So I think for me, I mean, extremely simplistic takeaway perhaps would be that, you know, government intervention does seem to be increasing, but it's innovating, you know, in the forms it takes. Uh, and at the very least, uh, additional dialogue on what we might want to do with the rules, transparency and enforcement would perhaps help us to have something of a, a smoother uh, recovery over the next couple of years. Um, maybe we can turn to each one of the panelists for a final uh, couple of thoughts, anything you want to bring up that hasn't been brought up, any uh, reflections others have said or any uh, nice quotes you want us to tweet out from what you've said. Um, should we do that in the uh, uh, same order we started? So go first to Mark, then Janet, then Kamala. Well, uh, maybe the only thing I want to I want to say is that uh, indeed I think uh, uh, because because of, uh, of of where I sit and who I am uh, as an economist, I think uh, yes, indeed more more effort on transparency and and uh, and um, sort of research. Uh, I talked about uh, the spillover effect. Uh, I mean, are definitely uh, important things. Uh, they're not necessarily the the, the silver bullet, but uh, they, they are definitely an important element. Sure, should I jump in? Please. Um, I think one point that I would make, and it's really in some ways that uh, follows on from what Pamela said, I, I think one of the complexities that we have to deal with is the interlinkages between all of these issues. Pamela brought up antitrust policy. I think in a way that we haven't seen before, we have this crossover between so many policy areas. Um, antitrust, to some degree, um, and enforcement is sort of being seen as a trade tool um, in certain countries. So I think part of the difficulty is, um, you know, each of these areas deserves sort of its own conversation, but there's overlap between all of these areas, and they really, to some degree, have to be seen both individually but also holistically how they fit together. And that just may may make the conversation a little bit more difficult or the, the puzzle a bit more difficult to resolve in the future. Ms. Kamala? Um, well, I, I think, you know, a lot of people say that identifying the problem is 99% of the solution. And the problem is so complex and the spillovers are so... Um, pernicious and uh, non-transparent that really is about identifying the problem before we try and throw money at it, throw something at it. So, you know, there is a role for policymakers, there's a role for businesses. Businesses should be feeding us information about what the problem is for them. And, and we should all be trying to identify what the actual specific problem here is. Is it cooperation or is it non-understanding of what's going on? Uh, so let's let's try and work on what exactly the problem is here. Great. Well, look, let me say thank you all very much for a uh, wide ranging and, and fascinating discussion, which has, I think, exactly worked towards that of trying to help identify what the, the questions are. Um, now, of course, we're all aware that there are many, many uh, people around the world working on these issues. Uh, as mentioned at the start, at the forum, we've assembled a working group to try and think through some of these issues and try and help inform whether it's senior business, senior po policy leaders. And we really do want to help uh, a recovery and a rebuild that, that works for all. So we're not leaving uh, any behind. And we're trying as much as possible to take a cross-cutting approach rather than to get deep into any one uh, policy silo. So we're really trying to highlight the, the work of others. Um, you know, for anybody who is new to this topic, on the call, as you know, there have been many uh, 
things which have been mentioned, Simon Evanet's work uh, with the Great Global Trade Alert. There's a very interesting paper out recently by Rob Howes, the European University Institute have done some very interesting work in this area, and many, many others. Um, we will be bringing out a short paper in a little while, um, as I mentioned, authored by Kamala. Um, and if anybody on this call is interested, please do get in touch. We really would love to, to hear from you and to continue the conversation. But I think for now, let me thank uh, again our panelists, uh, Mark, Janet, and Kamala, um, and thank all of you who, who joined this call and uh, wish you a, a great day. And I think there's a survey which will pop up. If you're able to answer that, that would be great. Otherwise, thanks, everyone. Thanks. Bye-bye.